Well, we have some information up there. We've been over this part of it. Let's remember that our study is focusing initially on three things. First of all, that God the Father was not separated from God the Son while there on the cross. And we've explored a lot of that already scripturally so that we can understand that God cannot be separated from God. There's a lot of foolishness out there today that is not only bad theology, it's wrong, and uh, it does not have reverence for what the Word of God says about the person of the eternal Son of God. The second part of that study, which we will begin soon, will be the fact that neither was their fellowship broken between the Father and the Son while the Son was on the cross. The conversation that the Son had with the Father, the petitions that the Son made to the Father, the fact that the Son could look over at the one criminal who repented and who said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And the Lord say to him from the cross, Verily I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Imagine hearing those words on the part of a criminal who is now forgiven. Now how could our Lord forgive a criminal if our Lord became a criminal? How could our Lord forgive a sinner if he became a sinner on the cross? How could the Lord do a work of rescue if he himself succumbed to the very things that, that have put you and me in the place of spiritual death? We don't need anyone to jump in with us and be, become as we are in the sense of spiritually dying. Because a, spirit, a spiritually dead person cannot uh, help a, a spiritually dead person. That's the reason why human beings could never ever merit or work their way out of their sinful condition. And so there's a lot of fallacy that is flopping around in our pulpits today and we really need to be careful. Martin Luther back in the uh, 1500s was going back and forth on this issue and was saying that Christ uh, didn't commit those sins but then he was saying that he became guilty of those sins and back and forth he went. Now at the very bottom of our screen up there you'll see some words that say to Luther, somehow Christ must be overcome by sin and the curse before he could have victory over it. But the question is this, at what point was Christ defeated on the cross, according to him, and others? And when did his victory ever arrive? If Christ was not victorious at every moment where he was, the time of his defeat and then his victory. Where, where would his defeat have started? Where would his victory begin? If he was not in victory mode the whole time over our sin. Yes, there was a battle at the cross. Yes, our Savior suffered beyond anything that we could imagine. But did sin at any moment on that cross overcome our Savior? Now, M Martin Luther seemed to, to indicate that uh, the infinite righteousness of Christ could pull him out of defeat into victory. The question would be, 
Why did Christ ever have to go in to uh, defeat to begin with? And who was it or how did it happen that if he was in defeat, what, pa what a part of that work on the cross remained defeat? In other words, if he didn't have victory over everything at that cross, then how can you and I depend on him for a full and a complete and an eternal salvation? If what he faced was part defeat and part victory. And so we put that up there in these words. If the infinite righteousness of Christ could pull him out of defeat into victory, how could that infinite power and holiness fail when facing the sin he was bearing for all mankind? The Lord is the Almighty at the beginning of his crucifixion. He's the Almighty throughout the crucifixion. He's the Almighty at the end of the crucifixion. And being the one who is God, who has taken upon himself flesh, was the only one who could qualify to be able to go to that cross in perfect holiness as the perfect offering for the sin of mankind and thereby set us free. So we add up here to what we had been studying before. In what way was Christ made a curse for us? He was not cursed of God, remember that. He was not cursed of God. Even though Deuteronomy, I believe it's 21, 23, uh, says about people that are hung on a tree that they are accursed or accursed of God. Galatians 3.13, if you follow here, makes that clear as the Holy Spirit does not quote His inspired word with the use of cursed of God. Those two last words, of God, are not there. Let the Holy Spirit interpret His word. Let the Holy Spirit show you what your understanding should be. And where the Holy Spirit takes certain words out, don't you add them. If the Holy Spirit puts certain words in to give commentary on something, don't take them away. And yet people, even professional uh, theologians, and by, by what, I, uh, what I mean by that is a professional theologian would be one who is committed his life to the study of the word and of theology and is now an educator. And if they're saying something like this, that he was cursed of God, which uh, some educators do, and even in some of our fundamental Bible seminaries and Bible colleges, it doesn't mean that because they say it that we have to believe it. I'll stick with the word. I'll stick with Galatians 3.13. He was made a curse for us, but he was not cursed of God. Now, if people attempt to, in some way, unravel the full mystery of what happened there at the cross, they need to learn very quickly, they need to learn before it's too late, that we cannot penetrate the depths of that mystery because what Christ did, we are told in Scripture, conquered all your sin and all my sin. And we are at a bank on that by faith. That when Christ Jesus cried out, and it was a shout, it is finished. What does it mean? Well, that's the sim simplest thing to explain from the standpoint of what Christ did in his work at Calvary, and that is that the work is finished. It remains finished. And whoever is in their sins still can cry out to the Lord Jesus and know that all of their sins have been dealt with and taken away. And if, if you want that, you're the one that has to claim that and the Holy Spirit 
will be working with your heart and your soul to make you realize that the way we are by ourselves, we are lost and without hope in this world. Now, we put down here, if you take a look under letter E up there, if Christ were cursed by the law, he would have to become a lawbreaker on the cross. Christ never broke the law. Well, people would say he broke the law because he took our sins upon himself. Well, he took our sins upon himself because we're the lawbreakers. Now, does our Savior become a lawbreaker to save lawbreakers? How does one criminal save another criminal? When both are guilty. We needed a Savior on that cross, and we have that Savior on the cross, who is able to not only deal with sin in its entirety, but do what we heard sung this morning in special music, and that is to give and supply an overabundance of grace that is far beyond the awful condition of the sin of the human race. It took the eternal Son of God taking upon himself flesh and going to that cross to be able to get that done. That should make you happy and me happy for all eternity because that is our only way. He is the only way for us to be able to get to the Father and to know that we're going to heaven and so that uh, whenever the Lord decides that our time is up, we're ready we're ready we may not be in in a way ready in our behavior maybe we've not been living the way we should be living in a godly manner but the fact of the matter is when his righteousness is put to our account no excuse for us to go out and just sin the more but when his righteousness is put to our account then we're safe we are as secure as is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. No man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So, we ask a, a few more questions up here. Whenever did Jesus who gave the law break the law? When did he do other than obey and fulfill the law? What did the law or Satan find in Christ that the Father would have to place his curse on his Son? If our Lord broke the law on the cross by bearing the sin of the world, then he became a sinner and thus defeated. That's impossible and would undo the Trinity, which is an utterly ridiculous position that is unbiblical. The indestructibility of the eternal and equal union of the triune God is patent. It's evident throughout the Word of God. Having been made a curse for or on behalf certainly refers to Christ bearing the sin of the world and its curse and victoriously overcoming the nature and effects of both. Sinners put the curse of that accursed death that was upon Christ. Christ took the sin and the curse that accompanies it and that duo, that is the sin and the curse, met on the cross the altogether righteous Son of God who could deal with both and dramatically with infinite power bear all the sin natures of human beings and their innumerable sins and then sin's curse and yet he comes forth with such an eternally assured victory as our ransom and redeemer as the perfect offering Christ gave no place or any inroad for sin nor the curse of it to have any victory over him at all he's the victor who would pronounce sin as victorious over Christ on the cross. Boy, we just negated 
having a savior and you live the rest of your life in despair we come to this conclusion which we did before and there's some modifications so when Christ cried out my God my God why hast thou forsaken me yes the father forsook took the son to the redeeming work of the cross why he forsook him to the cross because there there was no other way for sin to be defeated there was no avenue there was no, no other road there was no other process there was no other act there was no other event the father forsook the son to the redeeming cross but could never forsake him on that cross while he was on that cross yes even the son listen carefully even the son forsook himself to that cross do you get that in order to bear sin on behalf of the human race and decisively triumph over sin at every moment upon that cross until his work was once for all finished I've told you this before but I'll share it again because I, I think it's I, I think it's something that is an experience in someone's life that we should share with you it so stunned me when I was teaching a Greek class in the graduate school over at what used to be called Philadelphia Biblical University I remember it that evening class they went about three hours long uh, stating to the students in light of some of our Greek studies that the Lord Jesus Christ did not fail on that cross but at every moment while he was on that cross he was a victor he was never a victim in the Old Testament when they had the the calves and the goats and the lambs uh, brought in as a sacrifice and their blood shed yes these were were dumb animals who didn't know anything and uh, were were being brought uh, as a sacrifice that would give us a picture in the Old Testament of what the coming seed of the woman of uh, the true Lamb of God would do however when Christ came he not only fulfills the picture in the Old Testament, but he more than fulfills it in the sense that he becomes the antitype. He takes the place of the type, but listen also, the word anti not only means instead of or in place of, but it can also mean against. And do you know that the picture of, of what Jesus did there on the cross demonstrated the insufficiency of the picture of the type in the Old Testament of the lamb being slain because you see Jesus Christ was not a victim on that cross he went to that cross he knew what was coming he had volunteered himself it was the father's will he obeyed the father and in perfect cooperation with the father and the Holy Spirit the son went to that cross and took upon himself all the sin of humanity and he won and that's what makes you and me so safe in the Lord Jesus Christ now keep in mind then Psalm 22 up here verse 1 really meant that the son was sacrificing himself and he was not sacrificing the essential unity of the Trinity this is from John B champion as the content of our minds endlessly differs when we're looking at a subject in the Bible what we see in Christ or his death can differ it can change the reason why when a hundred theologians look at the death of Christ on the cross and they come up with differing theories and so on is because not all 
are walking as close to the Lord as they should be, nor do they have the same sufficiency of understanding. And again, nor do they have the reverence that is necessary for uh, not trying to penetrate the area and theorize about it where we don't understand. But there are things we know we can say did not happen on that cross and there was no defeat of our Savior upon that cross. And then, Christ was made a curse for us in that God the Father, including the Son Himself, since He volunteered, and the Holy Spirit, listen now, would not physically sustain Christ for any time extended after sin was defeated. Why would the Father let His Son suffer unnecessarily? And so the timing of that event was precise in its six hours upon the cross. And so the Father and the Spirit would not physically sustain Christ for any time after sin was defeated due to the inhuman and ungodly method of death. Indeed, sinners put the curse of that accursed death upon Christ. Jesus' death was like his birth as being without parallel. Phony people would spend time reading some of these books that were written back in the 1920s and 1930s where we had some theologians who spent uh, enormous amounts of time in reading and studying the Word. They didn't have uh, the uh, opportunity of computers and so they would really dig. They would dig in libraries. They'd be uh, reading an enormous amount of books uh, but then they would take their time to be thinking on the scriptures because every book that man writes needs to come under the judgment of this word of God. But some people are really taken up with their theology and they believe they can't be wrong. And we know that there isn't a pastor who doesn't make mistakes or theologians who don't get some things wrong. If the systematic theology is out there that was ever written that is infallible, there'd be no other need for systematic theologies, but they keep on being written because they're always disagreeing with each other in certain areas of biblical study. You know what we need? We need to be all home with the Lord Jesus and taught by Him. And there is no room in heaven for other preachers. There's one preacher, there's one teacher, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, down here at the bottom of this slide, yet some say he died a spiritual death. But in the passage of Hebrews 2.14, it is shown that Satan has power to put to death spiritually. Uh, he did that with Adam and Eve by deception with Eve. And Adam, at the invitation of his wife, uh, outwardly rebelled against God. He knew that he would be taking sides with his wife against God. So, Satan has the power to put to death spiritually as he did with Adam and Eve. However, not without their cooperation. Sin is the great instrument of this death. Jesus delivers not only from both evil spirits and sin, but also from the fear of death. Now the devil wants to hold this fact of spiritual death in the hearts of unsaved people and use that as a fear factor in their lives. And so they'll be looking for any remedy except the the most simple remedy that there is and the only remedy that there is who is the Lord Jesus Christ now the devil according to Hebrews chapter 2 
only has power in death because of sin. And people remaining willful in not surrendering to Christ and his salvation. Hence, there is for most people a fear of death. Do understand that Christ Jesus had control while on the cross. Now, if he succumbed to any kind of sin on the cross, and in any way became a sinner, he no longer had control. Jesus Christ didn't cease being God on the cross. And he didn't cease being the perfect sin bearer. And so, do understand that Christ had all control while there on the cross as he allowed himself to go through that suffering uh, the, before the cross, the beating and the pulling out of his beard and the spitting of the germs of human beings into his, his bloody face. His visage, his appearance was marred more than any man, the word of God says in Isaiah 52, 13 to 15. But Jesus didn't stop his co-controlling work of holding the universe together while he was on the cross. Meaning, he didn't cease to be God while on the cross. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 uh, indicate to us, even while he was yet on the cross, he was still holding the universe together with the Father and the, and the Spirit. He cannot cease to be what he is from everlasting to everlasting. Christ gave up his spirit into the hands of the Father at the end of his redeeming work. And Dr. Champion says, being divine, he must take part in active participation in his own death and the committing of himself to God. No one person of the Trinity ever does anything which is not shared in cooperation by the other two. Even in the death of his son's body, this was true. He, Jesus, said, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it up again. Now, Champion wisely says the following. This is so good, I wasn't going to try and put it in my own words. His words do the best job. The more conflicting the theories of redemption, the more conflicting their corresponding interpretations of the scriptures with which they deal. It is strange that the more important, ma and, uh, the more important any matter set forth in the word of God the more certain that divergence of human opinions about it. Isn't that something? The more consequential, the more, the more delicate the issue in the scripture, the broader are going to be the interpretations. So how do you figure out what's right? Well, number one, find trusted commentators, but most important of all, let the Holy Spirit show you by comparing the word with the word that is the word in the flesh with his word that is written so we say up here or he says hence it could not be otherwise than that there is a decided conflict over the method and measures god has taken to meet the evil of sin and to solve its problem sometimes the human mind is rather easily warped in scripture interpretation by the theory it offers in explanation of redemption. Some prefer the prophetic material, uh, that is prophecy. They study prophecy almost to the exclusion of history in the Bible. And he makes a great point here. He says, for this reason, some put prophecy ahead of actual gospel history and teaching and explaining redemption. Now he goes on to explain this. He said they should remember that prophecy is prophecy and not history as of yet. That's the reason why right now on the internet, on YouTube and other places, you have pastors and Bible teachers ever telling you their viewpoint about how all the sequences are going to work out in what is yet prophetically future. And all you're going to do is watch one source of confusion after another until every now and then you hear a voice crying in the wilderness where they actually stick just with just what the word of God says. But listen to me. Though God has given the broad outline of prophecy, though God has given us details in prophecy, prophecy 
that is still out there in the future to us is not yet history. And you and I are going to be surprised at some of the details that come into that picture where on this side of anything being fulfilled with regard to the rapture of the church or the second coming of Christ, you and I are not going to be able to fill in that information. And if we try to, you're going to be wrong. So understand prophecy is very important. But history tells us what is in fact the data that has been fulfilled. And keeping that distinction is something that is very important. So listen to his experience. He says, second paragraph up there, watch it. The writer not long ago, that is referring to Champion himself, listened to the head of an important school of the prophets, I think this he meant here, Dallas Theological Seminary, while he was a guest preacher, that is, uh, this uh, fellow from Dallas, was a guest preacher in the city of brotherly love. Oh, I wonder where that is. And it's the city of brotherly shove. He took his test, test text <laughs> in the Messianic Psalm, which opens, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He began with the declaration that prophecy gives us a clearer and more helpful account, listen to this now, as to what really happened in the death of Christ than even can be found in the historical accounts of the New Testament. Now that's going a little batty up here. Well, Dr. Champion says, evidently that seemed perfectly true to a specialist in prophecy. His conclusions, therefore, were sheer relativity. That is what his own ideas were. Now look at this. He kind of rubs it in here a little bit. Just as any mother views her own baby as the latest and the last in baby beauty. We're all that way about our children. Never been a baby like this baby before. Never be like one like this baby again. And then when you come to be a, a grandparent, well, now how do you handle this? Is this first grandchild of yours more beautiful than your children were? Uh, you don't even think of that. You just say, this grandchild of mine, there's no grandchild around my grandbaby. No one ever looked like this grandbaby before. There'll never be another grandbaby to come after like this. That's the way some people feel about their theologies. Our theology is just so good. Uh, I gotta write a book on this so everybody can read my book. And then people get, read it and they get the good parts and then they get the parts that aren't right and they go and believe the wrong parts. It is easy to forgive her bias, he said, than to excuse that of a teacher of preachers who handles the word of God in the pul pulpit in sorry self-deception. He goes on, to impartial judgment when prophecy is passed into history History has more light to shed on prophecy. Now, understand, every one of us, when we come to the rapture of the church, and when the rapture of the church actually occurs, you're going to be looking at me, and I'm going to be looking at you, and we are definitely going to be saying, well, I didn't know that this would come before, the, and that this would come before, and that this, and that, that this, and this, and this. The rapture could be 50 years away yet, 100 years away yet. You know what? I sure hope not. I remember a Baptist preacher years ago saying, he said it to the, a, a, a whole room full of Baptist preachers, all of us guys. And he said, I don't have 200 years left in my eschatology. In other words, the Lord isn't going to wait another 200 years to come or to rapture the church. And all the faithful Baptist pastors out there went, Amen. They were all convinced there ain't going to be another 200 years here. You know what? You 
don't know. Now, you can be saying we're living in times that look like what our Lord was talking about that would lead up to the rapture. And that's where I stand, but just because I stand there, don't follow me. Because I could be taking you along to a path of despair if the Lord tarried. And then you get upset with me and say, well, that you'll know, have some choice words for me. But all he did was talk about the rapture of the church, and I expected the rapture of the church to come, and here I am, 85 years old. It's not here yet. And he told me back when I was 25, Just watch out for pastors. Test them. Test them by the word of God. And so what he goes on to here to say, take, thus taking the specialist, this is speaker in city of brotherly love from Dallas, taking the specialist on his own chosen ground, the 22nd Psalm does not teach the father's literal complete forsaking of the son on the cross. No messianic Psalm can picture the Savior as more alive to God than does this very Psalm 22. If actually he were forsaken, he could not be so perfectly responsive. Now that'll fly over the heads of people who just don't agree. Listen. This Psalm's conflict is not with God the Father deserting the Son. God the Son. Manifestly, the writer could not have meant actual abandonment by God when in this hymn he praises God for his faithfulness. And twice he says, be not far from me. In the 26th verse, the psalmist goes on to say, they shall praise Jehovah that seek after him. Would you say our Savior ceased to seek after the Father while he was on the cross? Oh dear. Don't denigrate the Lord Jesus when he's on that cross. And say because he, he fell into sin or became a sinner, therefore he could not be seeking after God. Praising God and seeking after him. And it is a crime, Dr. Champion says, to tear away the first verse of Psalm 22, 1 from all of the rest of the scripture. We repeat that God the Son's further prayerful requests in 11, 19, 20, and 21 are answered with verse 24, which is what we have quoted already. Always remember this. Remember verse 24. Remember verse 24. Circle verse 24. Underline verse 24. Highlight verse 24. You think you'll, uh, you think you'll be able to find that verse then? Circle the number. Underline the verse. I don't see anybody doing it. And highlight verse 24. Now, you know something? If you were in my class in graduate school, I'd be looking at you and telling you, this is going to be on your next test and you're not going to recognize it when I ask the question. Huh? You say, oh, you wouldn't do that, would you, pastor? Well, I'm not their pastor when I get in the classroom. I'm their teacher. So... Keep in mind, for he, the Father, has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Did you hear? Evidently, that is not enough for many people. Even most theologians, professors, and pastors, Champion continues, if this messianic psalm was fulfilled in Christ's experience on the cross, the Messiah, 
there is not a hint in it that he was to be actually abandoned by the Father who has never deserted any soul that trusted him, trusted in him. Even taking the circumstances of the psalm as all about Christ's experience on the cross, the Messiah is pictured as being surrounded by scorning, bitterness, I didn't finish that word out, or maybe I did, surrounded by scorning, bitter, and murderous enemies. It's an adjective instead of a noun. This is the situation which gives the true setting to the opening words, my God, my God, why hast thou left me to the mercy of those whose wicked will it is to destroy me? Now please pay attention to this next statement. Is that readable? That yellow? Hey, that doesn't look like it's all on the screen. I don't know what happened there. Very last statement here for today. And we'll come back to this because there's more to say about it. This psalmist, David, did not prophesy that the Son of God was to become a lost soul while dying to save the lost. Remember that, beloved. Now, do you see the... Uh, do you see the information in blue up there? All right. My God, my God. He's paraphrasing this now of 22.1a. My God, my God, why hast thou left me to the mercy of, of those whose wicked will it is to destroy me? And you might say to me, well, why would our Savior even say something like that? Because he knew he was going to the cross. He knew he was. He also knew that there was no alternative way. Just read in, uh, I believe it's John chapter 12. Just take your Bibles and let's go over there and we're going to be in our Bibles a lot more next week um, with reading certain scriptures and so on. But in John chapter 12, John 12, verse 27 now is my soul troubled, the Lord said. Well, who, who wouldn't be troubled? We're troubled by our own sins. And he's troubled as he faces all the world's sin being laid upon him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause, for this very reason, came I unto this hour. Now, take a look at the blue words up here again. My God, my God, why hast thou left me to the mercy of those whose wicked will it is to destroy me? And this is where we'd like to come right back into our study next week and consider that. The question we might ask about that. And say, what can this mean, to, at least to some extent? And then, Lord willing, next week, I would really love to get into Isaiah 53 and take a look at how that Isaiah 53 gives us the picture of a victorious Savior on that cross. Okay? Is it a deal? Okay? God willing, we'll be here. Okay? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the patience of the people today as we share together. And we ask thee, Lord, to please minister to our hearts, to give us a depth of understanding and commitment to this perfect Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who paid the fullness of of the cost that was needed on the cross. We know, Lord, that nothing was left undone. And that's the reason why we depend on Thee for the forgiveness of all of our sins and for the reality of a salvation that will last forever without there being any doubt. 
Bless thy people here at this church as we understand the lengths and depths to which our Savior went for us. Lengths and depths that we know that we cannot fully plummet nor can comprehend. But Lord, we have from the scripture the only valid picture of our Lord and Savior on that cross, dying for our sins, winning that victory, and shouting, it is finished. And may we lay it to our hearts today as we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.